You know, the National LGBTQ Task Force Faith and Family uh, Power Summit is all about welcoming, affirming, and amplifying the voices of LGBTQ people of faith and our allies. And it couldn't be more timely um, as the opponents of equality scheme harder than ever to exclude us from pl our places of worship, exclude us from our faith, exclude us from our family, and exclude us from just being human. And it's, it is the right time and the right place for us to come together to train and to mobilize for change. One of the things I'm most excited about is that this is an interfaith gathering with folks from all across the country who are doing work also all across the globe. And so I am just thrilled and honored to have as friends and colleagues and participants of this conference, uh, Imam Dayi, who is the executive director of the Mecca Institute, uh, the amazing Bishop Rawls from North Carolina, who is the ex executive director of the Freedom Center, uh, B Bishop Allison Abrams, uh, who has done amazing, who's doing amazing work in Maryland, as well as has a, a brilliant and moving story about what, what, is, what she experienced in, in uh, Detroit, and also uh, Bishop Joseph Tolton, who does international work with TIFA. And so I am uh, just moved to be in this room, in this space with colleagues and friends who are doing wonderful work. Uh, but to start us off, I would actually like to ask Bishop Rawls to share your experience and the work that you're doing and why you're here at the Power Summit and why this Power Summit is important to you. Well, thank you, Rodney. Um, this summit is something that, to my knowledge, is a first of its kind in terms of how we're gathering leaders together, and particularly in a city like this. Um, I think it is critical that as faith leaders in particular, and people of faith, particularly that are LGBTQ, um, that we understand that there is something we have to offer in the public sphere, and that those voices, when denied, everybody loses. Um, we have been doing a body of work in Charlotte, North Carolina, and in the Carolinas, um, a campaign we have called Do No Harm. And the goal of Do No Harm is something that really should not even have to be a conversation, but it is a charge, particularly to people of Christian faith, to not cause harm on the basis of religious text of any sort um, and on preconceived notions of any of God's children. In particular, we're talking about lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, uh, identified and genderqueer people. Um, one of the things that was also very important about coming to this gathering was the opportunity to meet with other leaders like my colleagues here on this panel. Um, that was vitally important because when thinking of the way that God is moving, walls are being torn down every day. And those walls are walls that have been not set up by God, but set up by humanity and fear. And so I am so proud of so many of the leaders that I have been working with over the years. Uh, Imam Dai and I have known each other for almost 20 years or so, um, and others. So it is wonderful to come together and now be able to do that work, strategizing together. I think it is also important that we are doing this work in Salt Lake City. So I really appreciate the fact that the task force has chosen this space to do this work, where so much pushback seems to be coming in terms of the LGBT child of God. And so this is a great day for us, a great day for the world, I believe. And I want to say the world because the work that Bishop Talton is doing in Africa and other parts of the diaspora, I think, is absolutely phenomenal because we have to open this up now. Thank you. You know, one of the things that is really uh, amazing about this work is that sometimes we think our work is only happening or what's happening is only happening in the U.S. Yeah. And Bishop Tolton, can you talk about uh, the exportation of homophobia and the work that you're doing and why this is important for this summit? Thank you, Reverend McKenzie. I'm delighted to be here at the task force in part because the task force has remembered that there is a machine uh, that we call the religious right that is deeply invested in exporting homophobia beyond our borders and in particular to countries in Africa. 
they have, uh, in particular, adopted Uganda as the place that would be their laboratory, where they would really try to own the social trajectory of that particular nation and really set it up uh, as a Christian state. And we have a responsibility as people of faith who are LGBTQ to stand up and say, no, not in our name and not with our dollars. And we have a message of hope and love and acceptance that it is our responsibility to take to our brothers and sisters, and not in the spirit of colonialism, but we're moving from colonialism to making connections, to build a pan-African progressive movement of change, where we are invested in our collective freedom as we change the face of Christianity around the world. Oh, thank you. You know, one of the things when people think about faith, we automatically assume that we're talking about Christianity. And that's not true. And Imam Dayi, I would love for you to talk about uh, your work and why uh, us understanding about Muslims as well, when we talk about faith, is critical, and why you're here also at the Faith and Family Power Summit. Okay. Well, thanks for mentioning that because so often, particularly in the West, when we think about religious diversity, we only think within that Christian framework. Yeah. However, even as a Muslim, there's a great diversity of Muslims around the world, too. So we stand mirrored to each other in many different ways. But also, we mirror some of the same problems within our understanding of our texts, mm. understanding of human nature, understanding of human sexuality. And all of these things continue to mirror each other, and in some ways can be actually frightening because they are so limited in how their scope is done. Yet, one of the things I found is that once we're able to have the dialogue, we're able to have the real storytelling of human lives, mm -hmm. then they start to see that their lives are no different than other people's lives, both from the, the LGBTQ Muslim community, but also those who are Muslims who are non-gay. Their lives also mirror the poor, the disenfranchised, and those other types of things that are there too. So once we're able to see that we are not so different from each other, even though our borders and our geographical locales can be very unique, mm. that it makes us all human. And that's one of the things that I teach, that we're all part of this together. Thank you, Imam. I really appreciate that. Um, lastly, I would love, um, I have been so moved uh, by uh, Bishop Abrams and your story and who you are and how you do your work. Can you tell us a little bit about you and why you decided to come to the Faith and Family Power Summit as well? Sure, sure. I'm Bishop Allison Abrams. I pastor Empowerment Liberation Cathedral in Silver Spring, Maryland. And um, it, it was brought forth or it was birthed because of my own pain. And I needed to turn my own pain into power. And I refused to no longer preach and pastor or lead God's people because of my orientation. And so I know many people think that orientation, your sexual orientation, will determine whether you can be a person of faith. People think that uh, being Christian and being gay is an oxymoron. And so I knew that was not true. And so my passion led me to, when I resigned from my church in Detroit, um, some of you may have heard that story, but when I resigned from my church in Detroit, uh, where I was I don't want to say kicked out, but uh, released from many organizations, released from many positions that I had. Um, and so I was in a place of pain. And I said, I know God is still calling me. God is still saying he can use me. And so what do I do with that? And so as I searched my soul and I realized I still had options, I refused to let go of my faith, refused to let go of my belief. I said, I know there are other people out there who are experiencing the same thing. And so as pastor of this church in Silver Spring, Maryland, I have experienced so much healing in our congregation. But one of the main things was that people didn't believe they could be gay and be Christian. They didn't believe they could be gay and serve a higher power. They didn't believe that they could be gay and express that faith that they had on a regular basis. So we've worked a lot with that. I've been working with pastors as a bishop. I'm still working with pastors, but I'm working behind the scenes for a moment. Still working with pastors who are uh, gay and struggling in their traditional denominations because they have been told, I recently got a letter from someone who's been put out because of her orientation. And so people are so wounded, pastors are wounded, ministers are wounded. And so I've been working with them to bring them to a place of understanding of scripture first and foremost, and understanding the God that they serve, mm -hmm. and understanding that you can still serve God, you can still love God, you can still minister 
to people. You just have to remove yourself from that place of uneducation to a place of education. And so I like to look at the miseducation mm. of the, the <laughs> Negro. You remember that? And so I like to call it the miseducation of the Christian. Mm. And so we have to begin to educate our people and let them know that there is a place for all of us and God's kingdom is inclusive. And so that's the work I've been doing since I left Detroit. Uh, still would like to do some of that, some more of that, but I so appreciate that. I'm here because I wanted to be able to congregate, meet other pastors, bishops like myself, and other people of faith who are open and unapologetic about it. So that's why I'm here. Amen. Great, great. And so I'm, I'm curious, I mean, for anyone, what else would you, what, what else would you want people to know about why the Faith and Family Power, uh, Power Summit or why uh, LGBTQ people of faith and our allies are critical right now in this moment. What else would you like? I, like Bishop uh, Abrams, um, I, I come from a background that is Baptist and Church of God in Christ. So very, very fundamental upbringing. And to be quite honest, it took me many years to just accept my own self um, at a, as, a, as a same gender loving woman. My wife and I have been together for 16 years. We have children, we have grandchildren, we have two dogs <laughs> in our home, <laughs> and, uh, and we go through the same challenges uh, other families go through. And we live in a region of the country where there are more LGBTQ families in the South than any other part of the country. And so when we start talking about things like the damage done by faith communities, you can't throw a rock and not hit a Christian in North Carolina, okay? And so, you know, and so when we think about that, and when we think about the fact that there is a fair percentage of those individuals who are LGBTQ and affirming, that those individuals also have an equal right to kingdom benefits. Mm. That's right. And that there is a responsibility that I believe I have in my calling and others have to be able to offer that good news to everybody mm -hmm. and not with condi condition. God does not have any stepchildren, any bastard children. God only has children. Mm -hmm. And it is important that we share that particular truth. And I want to close with the fact that when I talked about the family piece, one of the things that is so critical when thinking about these families in the South in particular, the Southeastern US, is that um, these religious refusals and religious exemptions, that is a scary slope for anybody who has any understanding of civil rights in America. Yeah. So if you think that you are okay backing anything that suggests that I don't have to serve a particular population for a particular faith-based reason, if you think that's gonna stay isolated with the mm. gays, you are woefully wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because then someone could also be able to say, it is against my belief to serve Muslims. It is against my belief in faith tradition to serve people who are not married as a male and female. It, it is a frightening slope, and it has nothing to do with the liberties set by the framers of the American Constitution or the Bill of Rights. So we're doing that work here as well, and that's also why it was important for me to be here. Well, I, lo I love what you said. It, it just brings up for me why we wanted to do this power summit in Utah. I mean, we knew that the World Congress of Families in just a, a week from now will be doing their anti-gay families, anti like our families are not natural, this whole kind of conversation that we know is wrong. Mm -hmm. And we know that faith actually liberates. It doesn't yes. harm people. Absolutely. And so we really wanted an experience so that, so that people of faith who are LGBTQ can actually come out about being people of faith as well as people of faith can come out about being welcoming and affirming yes. Yes. of LGBTQ yes. people. And we also really wanted an opportunity and experience for us to actually do this work in a public way, in a bold way. Hence why we're doing 40 Days of Actions so that we can put our faith in action, yes. uh, which you can find out more at the taskforce.org slash backslash faith and family. Uh, but one thing that I wanted you all to know about is the Shower of Stoles that we have, which really collects the stories of people of faith who have been, who have been harmed, or who, have been, who have been harmed in their faith traditions, and have been told that they cannot be people of faith publicly. And this is a, a series of stoles that we actually travel across the world and travel across the United States to tell our stories about being people of faith and why being people of faith in LGBTQ is not a contradiction, that we can be both. Um, and one thing that we're actually wanting to do and we're going to do today is actually we're going to dedicate a stole uh, in Bishop Abram's name uh, to, to share your story and to let people know 
about you and about who you are and about your powerful ministry. So I'm very grateful for you. Very grateful for you. Um, so this is going to be, we're going to have an opportunity to take some pictures. If there's some pictures or interviews, if you have any questions for any of these amazing folks who are here. But I wanted to just have some time to see if there's any questions that folks may have uh, for anyone here. Yeah. No. 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 I, I won't mention that there were several other um, conferences around the around the country, both in San, uh, Portland, where there was uh, LGBT religious leaders supporting Black Lives Matter. There was a transgender event that went on in San Francisco. So there were other events that were just as important as attending the the, the Parliament for Our Religions. But do but do know that there were a number of gay Muslims there. Mm. Okay, so. That's great. Thank you. Any other questions? Also to this point too, um, I just came back while this was starting from Berkeley, California, where we were meeting on the campus of Pacific School of Religion with transgender seminarians. So there are many, many people of faith that are doing very intentional work. And for those who desire to sign on to our Do No Harm Pledge, um, I, and as for all faith traditions, I would encourage you to go to donoharmpledge.org and you can learn more about that and we ask that you sign on because we want every um, state in the union to be represented in terms of saying we're not going to do harm. Great. Any other questions? Or? Well, I want to thank all of you uh, for being here today. I think uh, for us at the task force, we really see this as an opportunity for LGBTQ people of faith to really come out about our faith uh, as well as to support our allies to come out as people who welcome, affirm, and who love people of faith. Uh, and this is the moment to do that. And we know uh, politically that this is the conversation that our world is happening. And we are choosing not to hide, but we're choosing to be people of faith publicly. Uh, so thank you so much for being here.